Hello everyone, welcome back to the Caro Khan vs Everything speedrun. For those of you new to the channel, my name is Alex, I'm rated around 2000 ELO over the board classical chess. And this series, we basically play a rapid game on chess.com, and whether we have the white or the black pieces, no matter what my opponent plays, we go for a Caro Khan-esque setup. And even with the white pieces, it works surprisingly well. If you want to check out the previous episodes of this series, playlist is linked below. With that being said, let's get into the game. Okay, we are facing Gabrielozo from Austria. We're going to play C6, of course. We play C6 against anything, but fortunately my opponent has gone E4, so we're going to get a proper Caro. My opponent can play a lot of different moves here. Knight F3, Knight C3, D4. F4 is a move. Bishop C4 is a very strange, but is a move. Um, it's called the Hillbilly Attack. But my opponent goes for the main line with d4. Of course, we're going to go d5. And again, there's loads and loads of different ways white can play this. Knight d2, knight c3. You can ex go for the exchange variation. You can go e5. You can go f3. You could even go bishop d3. You could even go for some weird gambits with knight to f3. There are so many different options you can play from the white side. My opponent chooses to be relatively boring and go for the exchange variation now this i always see as a bit of a plus two black because we have two central pawns and white only has one now the issue is how can we actually make the e-pawn felt because the only way we can really get this pawn to properly fight for the center is to go e5 right the pawn is fine on e6 of course but e5 would how would be how we properly fight for the center that, however, is very dubious, because if we have some kind of exchange, and let's say, like, I have a knight on c6 to take back, then our d5 pawn is going to be isolated and therefore quite weak. So normally, the pawn or, like, the e-pawn goes to e6, and it's a little bit passive, you could say, but a pawn's on f7, e6, d5, incredibly solid. Opponent goes to bishop d3, very normal move, I'm going to play knight f6. You can go knight c6, you can go a6 as well. That's also a completely valid way to play the position. But I think moves are somewhat interchangeable in this position. So, okay, my opponent goes h3, which I was kind of hoping he wouldn't. Part of the reason I played knight f6 was so if knight f3, I could go bishop to g4. And if my opponent played something like c3, which is a very normal move here, then I can still go bishop to g4 because my knight would be supporting the bishop. The problem is, for me, after h3, my opponent controls the f5 and g4 squares, so there's not an obvious place to put my bishop. I'll probably end up leaving it behind the pawn chain and go e6 before my bishop can escape to lock it in, which is not the end of the world. You can always fee and keto it if you want, or the bishop can just be more of a defensive piece on a square like d7. That's not a problem. You could argue that white's wasted time by going h3 anyway. So I'm going to go e6. I might play a6 at some point. Uh, I'll probably develop my bishop to d6 if I'm given the opportunity. My opponent could go bishop to f4 to stop me from doing that, of course. And then I'll probably just put the bishop on e7. It's not the end of the world. I could also play queen to b6 to try and target the weak b2 pawn if bishop to f4 is played. That's a very common theme in the Karo Khan. So, okay. Bishop d6. My opponent could now go for bishop to g5 because he would be pinning my knight and it would be a bit silly for me to move my bishop again and bring it back. But if bishop g5 h6, if my opponent exchanges, then fantastic. Bishop g5 h6, you'd expect bishop to h4. I can probably play g5 in that position, kick the bishop back and mess the pawn structure up a bit. Maybe I can castle queenside. I don't know. My opponent goes bishop to e3, which is just a bit more solid. I'm actually going to play h6 in this position. It's not necessary, but I don't like the idea of anything coming to the g5 square. And I also make sure that h7 is no longer a target because there is not a pawn there anymore. Because it's always just a bit of a scary thing when the light squared bishop, the knight and the queen are positioned in this way. Okay, queen d2. Now, you would expect that is lining up against the h6 pawn, so that if I castle, white might be trying to sacrifice the bishop for two pawns, which I don't want to allow. One of the downsides of playing queen d2, however, is that this knight doesn't have a natural developing square. 
D2 is where this knight should be going. C3 isn't very good because it blocks this pawn from going to C3 or C4 to support the D4 pawn, which is where the C pawn should be. The pawn normally goes on C3, but white can be more aggressive with C4 and try and break apart my nice center. I'm tempted to play bishop d7. a6 also looks good, maybe looking for some queenside expansion. Queen b6 is okay, but I probably want to play b5 at some point, so I don't really want to block that. I'm going to play a6. I'm going to delay castling. I might not castle. You don't have to uh, in these positions, to be honest. And also with knight c3, I didn't want the knight to come to b5 to put pressure on my bishop. Knight c3 is played. I would expect that he might be trying to root it through e2 onto a square like f4. Otherwise, it's a bit of a silly piece in my opinion. Okay, b5 followed by bishop b7 looks pretty good to me. I'm going to play it. a4 is certainly a move, but we just push b4. We attack the knight, support with a5. That's not a problem. a3, I'm not concerned. I didn't really want to play b4 anyway because... I don't want to encourage this knight to get to a better square. This knight is fighting over squares that I control incredibly well. And it's kind of an obsolete piece on the c3 square and also stops this pawn from doing anything. We have now clamped down on the c4 square. But this pawn should be going to c3 to defend d4 and relieve these pieces of their defensive duties on the d4 pawn. So, not the end of the world for my opponent, but definitely a bit of a positional... Mm, sort of not inaccuracy because it's not one move but like it's just not quite correct i'm gonna go rook c8 which is a bet obviously i'm getting it on the open semi open semi file <laughs> on the semi open file right because i have no c pawn this move is way better than in most karo khan positions because this knight is on c3 which means not only is this knight potentially vulnerable, but the c2 pawn is also potentially vulnerable. If the pawn was on c3, this knight would not be here, and this pawn would be incredibly well defended by another pawn, and the c file just wouldn't be that big of a deal. I'd probably still try and fight for the c4 square and get a knight there, which might be what I do in this game. But yeah, that is... The knight on c3 and the pawn on c2 are just potential targets for my rook. Now, will that come to fruition anytime soon? Honestly, probably not. But I'm just optimizing my pieces a bit because I don't want to castle and allow bishop h6, pawn h6, queen h6 because that looks absolutely terrifying. So again, I might just leave the king in the center. Uh, we can decide at a later date. Rook c1 is a bit of an odd move in my opinion because this pawn can't move. Okay, knight a5 looks good, queen b6, eh, I don't know, it's not that, not that good of a move. Um, not obvious how I make progress here, but that's sometimes just the nature of these Cairo Khan positions where, especially in the exchange, things can just get kind of, um, kind of dull, and you just have to play more of a positional jostling game. I like the idea of knight a5 though. Because if b3 is played to control c4, it becomes harder for my opponent to play the pawn c3 in the future and destabilizes the knight. So I think that would be worth my time. Well, also, if b3, you would just hang the a3 pawn, which is one of the problems of moving the rook to c1, which I only just noticed. So that's very nice. Also, don't worry about any tactics on the knight because it's defended by my queen. That is not a problem. I'm pretty happy with this. I think. Um, yeah, of course, this bishop is a little bit passive, but it does support a knight coming to e4 at some point in the future, potentially, and just helps to hold down some of the light squares on the queen side. This dark square bishop is absolutely fantastic, and my opponent plays bishop to f4 to try and challenge it, but I think that loses... Well, not loses, sorry. That's the wrong word. But after knight c4, attacking the queen, my opponent will be forced to take it because if he moves the queen, he can't defend the bishop. And of course, if uh, knight c4, bishop d6, we just win the queen. So knight c4, bishop has to take. And that was a powerful bishop. 
Like, that's a really good bishop. So it is very, very tempting to get that off the board. And then if something like knight c4, bishop c4, we could even take with the d-pawn, which looks counterintuitive to take away from the center and close the c-file, but these bishops could be... Well, this these bishops are going to get traded, but this bishop could be very strong, especially if he has no light-squared bishop. I really like that plan. I'm going to go for it, because I think that is very, very promising. And even though our d-pawn will no longer be in the center fighting for the light squares, we will remove his bishop from the board, which is obviously fighting for the key e4 square. And our bishop and knight will work together very nicely to control d5 and uh, e4. And of course, we're putting a lot of pressure on the king side. So I'm going to take uh, back with the d-pawn. Not necessarily the best move. I'm not really sure. Rook takes might have been good. B takes might have been good. It'll be, it'll be very interesting to see what the computer has to say about that. But I think this is very, very nice. And an added benefit is that if these bishops get traded, I can castle without having to worry about sacrifices. I have a very strong queenside pawn chain here. And I have a lot of pressure on the d-pawn. I have pressure on the knight. If I take it and my opponent has to play gf3, that will be a stupidly weak um, pawn formation on the king side. And my opponent is allowing me to do that. I think I have to take the opportunity. I don't know if I'm going to get it again. And I know this bishop was incredibly powerful, but look at these pawns. Like That's unsustainable. Completely unsustainable. And I think I can now castle. I think. Because if bishop h6, gh6, queen h6, I think I can play knight to h7, threaten queen g5 with a queen trade. Uh, yeah, and if, if my opponent moves his king to put a rook on g1, so let's say something like castles, bishop h6, gh6, queen h6, knight h7, which is important because it controls the, D the g5 square and blocks the h file off. Let's say king h1 to prepare rook g1. I can't play queen to g5 because that would lose a queen. Queen f6 would offer a queen trade. Rook g1 check. King h8. And that should be completely winning. If my opponent refuses the queen trade, let's say queen h5 to protect f3 then I can just play rook g8 and trade rooks and just be up a piece. So I'm going to castle. Of course, it is a little bit scary to allow bishop h6, but the reason I went for it is because my opponent no longer has the bishop on g3, sorry, d3, and no longer has the knight on f3, which as I mentioned back in the, was it this position? this position these were the pieces that i was scared of now my opponent has lost two of them so i think it's probably safe to castle and of course i concretely calculated a variation in which i can survive that if my opponent does go for the sacrifice so a mix of instinct and principle and um, and also a bit of calculation in there um but yeah i, I think that's not a problem and at the end of the day these are very weak pawns, and characteristically of the Karo Khan, these are some very nice pawns, some very safe pawns, one might say. I don't know why my voice just cracked like that, apologies. Um, yeah, of course I could have traded like that, but I don't want to allow his queen to get active. If we're going to trade, I want my queen on d6 and on the incredibly active square, rather than my opponent. Um... It'd probably be wise for my opponent to try and play d5 to trade these pawns off at some point. I think that would be a good idea. But we'll see if he goes for that. Knight h5 is a tempting move to play. I maybe could have played it last move. The idea being that I attack the bishop. And then try and get him to trade with me on my terms. And then I can access squares like f4 with the knight. 
However, if knight h5, maybe bishop h6, g h6, and queen h6 works a bit better then. Okay, my opponent goes king h1. He obviously wants to bring a rook to the g-file now. That is very, very clear. Maybe we now trade? We could... It's basically to stop any sacrifices now because he has an extra move. We could also go king to h7 just to defend the h6 square, step off of the g file so the g pawn can't get pinned. And then we can continue with our plan of knight to h5 to get a trade on our terms. Let's say king h7, rook g1, knight h5. Bishop g3 can be played because I don't want to take it and fix his structure for him. So king h7, rook g1, uh, knight h5, bishop g3. Maybe we can just go queen c7 and add another attacker. It's something like knight to e2 to defend the bishop. I'm not sure how we progress there. Not totally sure. Hmm. I feel like queen c7, well, queen c7 here, then bishop h6, g h6, queen h6, I'm not very comfortable with. So let's start with king h7. Yes, I know I could trade first, but I don't think I'm in a rush. I don't think my opponent can do anything too scary with this bishop right now. I, I can bail out and take at any point, so I don't think there's any need to be rushing it. I may be missing something, but I don't think so. A move like bishop to um, e5 is not scary. I could take if I want, but I could just ignore it as well. Um, maybe he wanna, would want to try and fix his pawn structure a little bit by connecting the pawn to the f pawns. Uh, with something like bishop e5, bishop e5, pawn e5. I don't like the... I don't think I like that that much, to be honest. Knight h5. Mm, I don't know. I don't know. We'll cross that bridge if we get there. I think bishop to e5 is a bit of a an unlikely move anyway. Just because to me it doesn't really look all that obvious. Maybe that's... Maybe that is a natural move, but I don't think so. By the way, if you are enjoying the video and you are not subscribed, then please go ahead and drop a subscription. Get these videos recommended to you in your feed more often and hopefully you can have some more educational and slightly entertaining chess content show up more often for you. We all just want to improve here, at least I certainly do, because um, my over the board chess league is starting up again very soon and I would like to continue my push um, higher up in over the board classical ELO and also... I think I'm going to be playing in a higher league. Oh, wow, he played it. I did not think he was going to do that. Ah, it's not the end of the world, but I think it's a nice move from him. I think it is. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Now, it doesn't... I suppose F4 is the idea. Which is annoying, because if f4 is played, then I can never really take, because his structure gets fixed. If bishop takes, rook takes, fine, I don't care. I don't think I care. But if bishop takes, pawn takes, I don't know if I love that. Because my knight doesn't have obvious squares to go to. Maybe I can be patient. And get this knight to the f5 square. Maybe I can just play into something like knight g8. To go to e7 and then f5. That's an idea. I suppose. Mm, knight g8. Rook g1. Take, take, knight e7. I feel like my opponent has gotten a much better position if that were to happen than he previously did. It wouldn't be bad, but he would fix his structure a bit. Bishop e5 is a nice move. I don't know if there was a whole lot we could have done about it, but whatever. We have the position now. 
let's figure out what to do. Hmm. Night. I feel like I need to do something with the knight. The knight is not doing a whole lot. I don't really want to go to d5 and allow a trade. I feel like that just benefits him. Because he wants to move the c-pawn. The knight may be coming to e5, sorry, e4 at some point. But that would take a bit more time from him. And then that wouldn't be quite as bad as me just allowing him to trade the knight instantly. Very well played to my opponent, by the way. Okay, I have a bit of an idea of trying to move this knight so I can play queen h4 and get a very active queen, right? That looks like a good idea to me. How do I facilitate that? Of course, I could facilitate it with knight d5, but I don't think I want to do that. I also have to be a bit careful because, of course, my queen is defending my bishop, so I can't just move her away willy-nilly. Um, let's say knight g8, rook g1, take, take, queen h4, uh, let's say rook g3, rook d8, or maybe this rook to d8, that looks alright, you know. That looks alright. I don't know if I'm missing something here, or if this is not a good plan. But it's something. It is definitely something. And I will take something at this point, because I'm really not sure how to move forward in this position. I feel like I'm definitely better. Like, I feel like I obviously have a better position. You could just look at the pawn structure, right? My opponent has doubled pawns, he has three pawn islands, I have two pawn islands, and all my pawns are very nicely situated to defend each other. However, from a peace activity point of view, I think my opponent's pieces overall are more active than mine. So, uh, that, oh, that is a really good move. That is a really good move. Ah, uh, I didn't consider that. Maybe rook c6 is an idea. Because I don't want to trade on his terms. That is a very nice find. Of course, he's just attacking my bishop, and I don't want to take him. I think rook c6 should be played, but then queen e5, and I lose my rook. No, that would not be good. Okay. Maybe I have to take. Take, take. I don't want to go queen e7 because that's where my knight should be going. Take, take. I can't go queen h4 anymore. I can go queen b6. Attack f2. That's not the end of the world. I could go queen to g5, but I don't really want to do this to my structure. At the end of the day, my advantage here is my superior pawn structure, so I don't want to give that away if I can help it. I think I have to take, you know. I'm not going to ponder it for too long, because I don't think I have a whole lot of choice. And I don't want to waste loads of time on that. So, okay, we're going to go for it. Of course, he takes with the pawn to open up the file, and just fix his structure a bit. Queen b6 looks like the best move to me. Maybe this is good, but the problem is, after the exchange, the g5 pawn is very weak, and I don't really want to play f6, because then the e6 pawn is going to become very weak after the trade. So I don't want to do that. I think queen b6 is good, because it just wins a tempo. You could argue that queen c7 is better, because we pressure the pawn, we defend f7 so this rook can move, and we stop a rook from coming to d2. But I think I I think my priority is getting my knight into the game. I think that should be the priority in this position. Because a knight on a square like f5 would be very, very strong. He might be trying to access d6 with his knight, which we would be defending a bit. But I don't know. I don't know. He can always give this check, but I don't think it's that useful. 
And also, if we move our knight and he does give this check, then we have the g8 square, which is a bit better, because we defend our f7 pawn, so this rook doesn't have to. Which I think is a good thing. Of course, this uh, move defends the pawn, also just holds on to the other pawns a bit better. We could consider rook c7 to defend f7 and stop a rook from coming to d2. But I feel like that's a little bit slow. I'm going to go knight e7. I don't know if I'm missing something. But one of the other advantages for us of my opponent playing king g2 is it's harder for him to get a rook on the g file to put pressure on g7 because he's blocked the file off himself. Which is definitely good. Definitely good, because a rook on g1 could be potentially scary. This position has definitely gotten a bit worse than it was, say, five moves ago. That is a nice move. I think I want to play queen b7 to defend a6, defend the knight, put pressure on the f3 pawn. We could start with knight g6. Attacking the queen, and if takes, then takes with check. King g3. Maybe we just drop back. It's an option. Mm. We could go queen a7. My issue with going for one of these moves is that after rook d1, uh, rook d2 could be a problem. If queen b7, my opponent could force a trade of queens, because this would be a check. I don't think I'm opposed to that. I don't think I'm opposed. I think a trade of queens should benefit me. Although he does have a monopoly over the only open file. So, I don't know. Maybe queen a7 is better. Pressure on f2, defend a6, defend the knight, defend e2. Let's say queen a7, rook d1, rook c7. And then we can prepare knight f5 to try and kick this rook out. Of course he could always go to d8. Uh, but I don't think that's actually a concern. I think we'd actually be okay there. Very complicated position. For sure. But I think queen a7 is the move here. I don't know if I'm missing anything. And also I just realized if rook d1, rook c7, rook e6 might be an issue. So rook c7, rook e6, f e6, queen f8. Mm, we're down a pawn there. Knight f5. Our king is safe for now. Rook d8. Preparing a check on the back rank. I don't know what we do there. So that's not amazing. Hmm. But I can't allow rook d7, I don't think. Unless I go knight f5, and then rook d7, and then I just move the queen. Let's say I go to e6, because I now control the d6 square, so my opponent can't play rook d6 himself. Okay, knight f5, rook d7, queen b6, let's say knight e4. That looks like a logical move. Then we could go rook d8, because we have enough control on the d8 square to challenge, and our knight blocks off the queen's attack on f7. I think that makes the most sense. So I'm going to play it. I don't really see a whole lot of other options. Uh, rook d7. Can I just play rook c7? Actually. Can I just go rook c7? If we trade, fantastic. If rook c7. If uh, rook d7, rook c7. Queen d2. Maybe that's the idea. Then we probably just go king g8. And we're okay. 
our knight, I would argue, is better than his knight. And still his pawn structure remains questionable. Of course, again, his pieces, at least his major pieces, are more active than mine. Ooh, taking, I don't know. Okay, of course I take back. I don't really have an option there. But this looks good to me. The pressure is relieved somewhat. My next move is probably rook d8 to facilitate an exchange of rooks. Unless my opponent goes for something like queen d2 to stop me from doing that. But that just hangs the e5 pawn. I think taking was an inaccuracy. Okay, he pins the knight, but not a whole lot else. I don't think that really does much else. Uh, I think rook d8 is the obvious move here. I'm going to play it. I'm low on time, so I should move a little bit quicker. I'm not concerned about something like rook takes, queen takes, and queen b7 with a double attack, because my opponent's king is way too weak for him to let me attack him. I think that would be pretty suicidal, and at the very least we'd be able to get uh, like a repetition of checks and a three-fold repetition like that, so we'd secure a draw at the very least in that kind of scenario. But I think we could just easily win. Okay, f4. Makes sense. If take, take. The knight probably is preparing to come to e3. We do anything better? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he survives this. It's an interesting move because the knight can come to a better square on e3 if I exchange with him. A good move. Maybe I just go g6 and let him make a decision. g6 is just an improving move. It breaks the pin, it defends the knight. And my king can come to g7, which is probably a better square to defend the f7 and h6 pawns, because they're kind of weak. Again, if takes takes... I mean, I don't have queen to g5 anymore, but I do control the d-file if that happens. The reason that I didn't want to take him is because if takes, knight takes, something like queen d8 or queen d7, probably queen d8, um, so I can use these dark squares... Knight e3, I can't move the knight because the knight's pinned, I'd have to go g6, something like takes takes. Then our pawn structures are basically identical, and there is absolutely no way I can win that position. This might just be a draw, and if so, my opponent has done an incredible job of maneuvering himself out of a what was probably a worse middle game, but we'll see. We'll see if he can traverse this position. I think g6... It's a very good move because it gives me more flexibility to move my knight. It allows me to continue improving my position if my opponent does nothing. And it asks my opponent the question of what he's going to do. Because it's not obvious what he should be doing here. A takes, of course we take back. Queen b7 might be stronger now. Because taking on f7 would come with a check and that would not be good. And also I can't play queen g5 check because he controls that square. So, if queen b7, I'd probably have to give up the a6 pawn. Which isn't ideal, but I think I play something like queen d4 and attack f2. Or maybe I go like queen to um, d2 and attack just everything. I don't think my opponent can allow that and kind of like get trapped in my position with his queen because my king on g7 would be pretty safe. Admittedly, admittedly a bit of an oversight to allow queen to b7, but I don't think I can be too badly punished for it, thankfully. It's also difficult for my opponent to access the f6 square with his queen, especially because my knight controls e7, so he can't do some kind of maneuver uh, through the 7th rank to the f6 square. The reason I mention that is because he could potentially get some kind of perpetual check that way. But I suppose if uh, my opponent was trying to give checks on d8 and f6, 
when queen to d8 is played, I could always go king to h7 then, and there would be no checks. So that would work anyway. Okay, yeah, queen b7. That is probably, well, it's the most logical move, I think. We're going to go king g7. I don't think I have anything better. That I did not expect. Okay. Maybe he's trying to get the knight into f6. I don't know. Knight h4 looks good. I think I like that move. I think. Knight to d6 is potentially a problem. But, okay, yeah, he moves forward. I have nothing better than to just give another check. I might just have to go for a perpetual check. I might not have anything better in this position, unfortunately. You, just, you, you have to be pragmatic sometimes and just admit you don't have anything better. My idea with giving the check on h4 is if he moves to the back rank, then I get queen to d1 with check, and that's probably good. And if um, he moves to h2, I was planning to give a check on f3, but whoa, that looks insanely bold. Wow. Queen d1 makes the most sense to me. I'm going to give the check. My opponent isn't threatening anything on my king right this second. Yes, this is potentially scary in the future, but right now I'm safe. So I have time to go after him and try and swarm him with my king, sorry, with my queen and my knight. Because his queen is cut off from coming back because the knight is on e4. That could come back to bite him. He only has one square to go to. Um... I don't really want to take on c2. That seems like a waste of time. Knight h4 check. King g3. Queen e queen f3. King h4. Does he survive? I don't know. Give the check. Again, it might just be a perpetual check. We might not have anything else. And to be honest, that wouldn't be the end of the world. Hmm. I could consider taking on c2, though. I could consider it. Yeah, I don't think queen to f3 works. Unless it does. Wait. I think it might work. I think it does. No, I, I've blundered. I blundered. Oh, I'm an idiot. I am an idiot. I've committed now, though. <laughs> oh, my God. Wait. Wait. It might work. Because the knight can't move without losing the queen. This might work. If takes, g5, takes, takes. You can't take with the knight because you lose your queen. Of course, if you go here, you just get mated. Takes here, takes, takes, if king takes, my opponent actually just resigns. That's completely winning. Wait. Oh no, I can just take on f4. What am I on about? f4 is mate. Oh my god. That was a complete draw. I'm sure it was a draw. But my opponent's weak king meant that he lost. Oh my god. I am so happy with that. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That's crazy. Let's see what the game review has to say, but um, I guess even exchange Karo Khan positions can still be exciting. Madness. Okay, so a very, very cool game. A game I'm happy with because I think we had an advantage going into the middle game, lost it a bit, but then brought it back in the end game with some very nice ideas. So let's go through the game. I'm sure it was not perfect. I had 88.4% um, accuracy, my opponent with 77.8. Of course, Karo Khan, my opponent goes for the exchange, bishop d3, knight f6. I was hoping for a move like knight to f3 so I could go bishop to g4. Or even on this move, I wanted, you know, bishop g4. 
But okay, bishop d3. We end up having to keep our bishop behind bars, but that's okay. Knight b4 is apparently a move here. Attacking the bishop. If check, bishop b7. That looks good for black. If the bishop retreats to e2, then the bishop gets the f5 square to attack c2. And white either goes knight a3 or probably has to give this check. Knight d7. Knight a3. And then we have some weird tactics on the bishop with uh, queen a5. Very interesting. That is something I will have to watch out for. Um, here, knight b4 is the move, but we go e6. It's not bad. Um, castle, bishop d6, bishop e3, h6. Uh, h6 is a move that I just like to throw in. Queen d2, yeah, the computer agrees, is an inaccuracy. Uh, it's, it's not the end of the world, but that's kind of where the knight should be going. Although the computer apparently likes knight c3, but I think that is because it wants to root it through e2. Yeah, that's what it wants to do. My opponent didn't do that, though. We go a6. Knight e4 was better. Uh, that's not really my play style. But I suppose the point is that if my opponent exchanges, you can't go knight to d2. And the computer actually just wants to give up a pawn. Like this. Interesting. Okay. I go a6 though, which is always a good move. Knight c3, inaccuracy. We go b5, which is not the best, but it's okay. a3, bishop b7, rook fe1, rook c8. We're just playing improving moves. Rook ac1 is definitely an inaccuracy. g5 is the a move that the computer wants to play, which is just mental. Queen c7 is also good. Knight h5 is also good. Just stopping bishop to f4. I think, I think the plan that I should have maybe gone for is something like knight to h5 and queen c7 to fight for the f4 square. Maybe put a knight there. But, um, okay, we go knight a5, bishop f4, knight c4. We force this, that this, this has to be played. D takes is the best, rook cd1. We go bishop to f3, this is the best move, and we do have a slight advantage. Here I could have taken, but I wasn't sure what the follow-up was. Something like castles, king h2 to prepare, like, rook g1. Hmm. Queen b6, rook g1. And queen b8 to try and exchange queens. That's a very convoluted plan. Okay, well, anyway. We castle, which is fine. King h1. Here we should have taken, but we didn't. Bishop e5 is the best move, which fair play to my opponent for finding. Knight g8 is not the best. Knight h5 is better. I suppose it keeps the knight more active. But okay, we go knight g8, queen f4. Here we have to take, which we do. And we retain a slight advantage, although queen c7 was slightly better. So annoying to have missed that. But king g2. Knight e7, rook d6, queen a7, queen a5 was better, but I actually don't know why, because this just looks like the queen is locked out of the game. Let's say rook e d1, b4, check, king g8, I mean, that. let's see, takes, takes, I guess we're just trying to go after the b2 pawn to destabilize the knight, but... That's a very engine-y way to play the position, to go pawn grabbing. Instead, I like to hold on to my pawns. Knight f5, rook d7, rook c7. Taking was not the best, and the computer agrees with me. Better was to bring the rook back, which is absolutely insane and unplayable. If queen d2, apparently you lose after knight h4. Why? Apparently, this is just losing. <laughs> I mean, okay. I, I mean, you can't take because this is just like a bit of a box that we're putting the king in and similar to what happened in the game. But yeah, why is this losing? F4? We just go onto this diagonal and if you take, you get cornered. That's insane to me. He takes though. Queen c7. Queen e4. Rook d8 is not the best. G6 is better. 
f4 is an inaccuracy, g6, rook d8, queen d8, queen b7. And here, yeah, we go correct with king g7. Knight e4 is the only move. If you take... Yeah, queen d2 was my idea, and black just instantly wins. So I'm correct in saying that white could not go pawn grabbing. Knight e4 obviously stops me from going queen to d2, which is the square that I wanted to go to. Knight h4 check is not good. g5 is better. Yeah, right. So I'm never, ever going to play that in a million years. <laughs> um... I think knight h4 is okay. King g3 is a mistake because of queen to d1, which I'm with, with, with the same mating idea, but I missed it. We give a check, king f3, queen d1 check, king g2. We go for this again, king g3, and the game is over. King h2 holds on, kind of, although you still just lose. Like, the game is all but over. What, what am I trying to do here? I don't know what the plan is. Oh, it's to take on f4 with check. You do a bit of a ladder thing, so you take on f4 with check. And yeah, that's game over. You can trade queens at any time as well. King g3, though, walks into queen to f3, which I'm happy that I saw. Now, I actually, for some reason, didn't see this mate. And g5 was the move that I actually saw. The point being, fg5, hg5, and if knight g5, you lose the queen. But if king takes, it's actually a draw. After this, that's a draw. Now, you can actually win this position if you find queen f4 check first. And then queen f5? What does that threaten? I actually don't know. Or king g6. Threatening checkmate because you now cover the h5 square with the queen. Sorry, with the king. And white has nothing better but to give up his queen. I don't know whether I would have saw that in all honesty. I think I probably actually would have gone for this. Sorry, this position. And maybe I would have had to settle for a perpetual. Maybe I can try and take here, but the computer doesn't think so. I'm probably just getting crushed by the three pieces barreling in on me. So we get a bit lucky, but chess always has an element of luck to it. And you create your own luck. So I'm happy with that game. My opponent played very well, so hats off to him. If you guys enjoyed this video, then you're going to love the rest of the videos in this playlist linked below. And also linked below is a playlist with every single game on my channel in which I play the Karo Khan, or the Karo Khan is featured in any respect. So thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.